Franz Joseph Hermann Michael Maria von Poppen, Erb Salzer zu Wohl und New Work, the 29th of October 1879, the 2nd of May 1969, was a German conservative politician, diplomat, Prussian nobleman and general staff officer. He served as Chancellor of Germany in 1932 and as Vice-Chancellor under Adolf Hitler from 1933 to 1934. Born into a wealthy family of Westphalian Roman Catholic aristocrats, Poppen served in the Imperial German Army from 1898 onward, and was trained as a German general staff officer. He served as military attaché in Mexico and the United States from 1913 to 1915, organizing acts of sabotage in the United States and financing Mexican forces in the Mexican Revolution. After being expelled from the United States in 1915, he served as a battalion commander on the Western Front of World War I and finished his war service in the Middle Eastern Theater as a lieutenant colonel. Appointed Chancellor in 1932 by President Paul von Hindenburg, Poppen ruled by presidential decree. He negotiated the end of reparations at the Lausanne Conference of 1932. He launched the Priusenschlag coup against the Social Democratic Government of the Free State of Prussia. His failure to secure a base of support in the Reichstag led to his dismissal by Hindenburg and replacement by General Kurt von Schleicher. Determined to return to power, Poppen, believing that Hitler could be controlled once he was in the government, persuaded Hindenburg into appointing Hitler as Chancellor and Poppen as Vice-Chancellor in 1933 in a cabinet ostensibly not under Nazi party domination. With military dictatorship the only alternative to Nazi rule, Hindenburg consented. Poppen and his allies were quickly marginalized by Hitler and he left the government after the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, during which the Nazis killed some of his confidants. Subsequently, Poppen served as an ambassador of Germany in Vienna from 1934 to 1938, and in Ankara from 1939 to 1944. After the Second World War, Poppen was indicted in the Nuremberg trials of war criminals before the International Military Tribunal but was acquitted of all charges. In 1947, a West German denazification court found Poppen to have acted as a main culprit in crimes relating to the Nazi government. Poppen was given an eight-year hard labor prison sentence, but he was released on appeal in 1949. Poppen's memoirs were published in 1952 and 1953, and he died in 1969. Chapter 1, Early Life and Education Poppen was born into a wealthy and noble Roman Catholic family in Wurl, Westphalia, the third child of Friedrich von Poppen Koningen and his wife Anna Laura von Steffens. Poppen was sent to a cadet school in Bensberg of his own volition at the age of 11 in 1891. His four years there were followed by three years of training at Prussian Main Military Academy in Lichterfelde. He was trained as a Heron Rater. He served for a period as a military attendant in the Kaiser's Palace and as a second lieutenant in his father's old unit, the Westphalian Ulan Regiment No. 5 in Dusseldorf. Poppen joined the German general staff as a captain in March 1913. He married Martha von Bosch Galhau on 3 May 1905. Poppen's wife was the daughter of a wealthy Saarland industrialist whose dowry made him a very rich man. An excellent horseman and a man of much charm, Poppen cut a dashing figure and during this time, befriended Kurt von Schleicher. Poppen was proud of his family's having been granted hereditary rights since 1298 to mine brine salt at Whirl. He always believed in the superiority of the aristocracy over commoners. Fluent in both French and English, he travelled widely all over Europe, the Middle East and North America. He was devoted to Kaiser Wilhelm II. Influenced by the books of General Friedrich von Bernhardi, Poppen was a militarist throughout his life. Chapter 2, Military Attaché, in Washington, D.C. He entered the diplomatic service in December 1913 as a military attaché to the German ambassador in the United States. In early 1914 he traveled to Mexico and observed the Mexican Revolution. At one time, 
When the anti huerta Zapatistas were advancing on Mexico City, Popin organized a group of European volunteers to fight for Mexican General Victoriano Huerta. In the spring of 1914, as German military attaché to Mexico, Popin was deeply involved in selling arms to the government of General Huerta, believing he could place Mexico in the German sphere of influence, though the collapse of Huerta's regime in July 1914 ended that hope. In April 1914, Poppen personally observed the United States occupation of Veracruz when the U.S. seized the city of Veracruz, despite orders from Berlin to stay in Mexico City. During his time in Mexico, Poppen acquired the love of international intrigue and adventure that characterized his later diplomatic postings in the United States, Austria, and Turkey. On 30 July 1914, Poppen arrived in Washington, D.C. from Mexico to take up his post as German military attaché to the United States. During the First World War, he tried to buy weapons in the United States for his country, but the UK's blockade made shipping arms to Germany almost impossible. On the 22nd of August 1914, Poppen hired U.S. private detective Paul Cohen, based in New York City, to conduct a sabotage and bombing campaign against businesses in New York owned by citizens from the Allied Nations. Poppen, who was given an unlimited fund of cash to draw on by Berlin, attempted to block the UK, French and Russian governments from buying war supplies in the United States. Poppen set up a front company that tried to preclusively purchase every hydraulic press in the U.S. for the next two years to limit artillery shell production by U.S. firms with contracts with the Allies. To enable German citizens living in the Americas to go home to Germany, Poppen set up an operation in New York to forge U.S. passports. Starting in September 1914, Poppen abused his diplomatic immunity as German military attaché and U.S. neutrality to start organizing plans for an invasion of Canada, as well as a campaign of sabotage against canals, bridges and railroads. In October 1914, Poppen became involved in the Hindu-German conspiracy, when he contacted anti-UK Indian nationalists living in California, arranging for weapons to be handed over to them. In February 1915, he organized the Vanceboro International Bridge bombing, while his diplomatic immunity protected him from arrest. At the same time, he was involved in plans to restore Huerta to power, arranging for the arming and financing of the planned invasion of Mexico. Poppin's activities were known to UK intelligence, which shared its information with the US government. As a result he was expelled from the United States for complicity in the planning of acts of sabotage. On 28 December 1915, he was declared persona non grata after his exposure and was recalled to Germany. Upon his return, he was given the Iron Cross. Poppen remained involved in plots in the Americas. He contacted in February 1916 the Mexican Colonel Gonzalo Enrile, living in Cuba, in an attempt to arrange German support for Felix Diaz, the would-be strongman of Mexico. Poppen served as an intermediary between the Irish volunteers and the German government regarding the purchase and delivery of arms to be used against the UK during the Easter Rising of 1916. He served as an intermediary with Indian nationalists as well. In April 1916, a US federal grand jury issued an indictment against Poppen for a plot to explode Canada's Welland Canal, he remained under indictment until he became Chancellor of Germany, at which time the charges were dropped. Chapter 3, Army Service in World War I As a Roman Catholic, Poppen belonged to the Centrum, the right of the Centre Party that almost all German Catholics supported, but during the course of the war, the nationalist conservative Poppen became estranged from his party. Poppen disapproved of Matthias Ersberger, whose efforts to pull the Centrum to the left he was opposed to, and regarded the Reichstag peace resolution of the 19th of July 1917 as almost treason. Later in World War I, Poppen returned to the army on active service, first on the Western Front. In 1916, Poppen took command of the 2nd Reserve Battalion of the 93rd Regiment of the 4th Guards Infantry Division, fighting in Flanders. On the 22nd of August 1916. Poppen's battalion took heavy losses while successfully resisting a British attack during the Battle of the Somme. Between November 1916 February 1917, 
Poppin's battalion was engaged in almost continuous heavy fighting. He was awarded the Iron Cross, first class. On the 11th of April 1917, Poppen fought at Vimy Ridge, where his battalion was defeated with heavy losses by the Canadian Corps. After Vimy, Poppen asked for a transfer to the Middle East, which was approved. From June 1917, Poppen served as an officer on the general staff in the Middle East, and then as an officer attached to the Ottoman army in Palestine. During his time in the Ottoman Empire, Poppen was in the know about the Armenian genocide which did not appear to have morally troubled him at all either at the time or later in his life. During his time in Constantinople, Poppen befriended Joachim von Ribbentrop. Between October to December 1917, Poppen took part in the heavy fighting in the Sinai and Palestine campaign. Promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, he returned to Germany and left the army soon after the armistice which halted the fighting in November 1918. After the Turks signed an armistice with the Allies on 30 October 1918, the German Asia Corps was ordered home, and Poppen was in the mountains at Karapuna when he heard on of November 1918 that the war was over. The New Republic ordered soldiers' councils to be organized in the German army, including the Asian Corps, which General Otto Lehmann von Sanders attempted to obey, and which Poppen refused to obey. Sanders ordered Poppen arrested for his insubordination, which caused Poppen to leave his post without permission as he fled to Germany in civilian clothing to personally meet Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, who had the charges dropped. Chapter 4 Catholic Politician After leaving the German army in the spring of 1919, Poppen purchased a country estate, the House Merfeld, living the life of a gentleman farmer in Dolmen. In April 1920, during the communist uprising in the Ruhr, Poppen took command of a Freikorps unit to protect Roman Catholicism from the Red Marauders. Impressed with his leadership of his Freikorps unit, Poppen decided to pursue a career in politics. In the fall of 1920, the president of the Westphalian Farmers Association, Baron Engelbert von Kirkerinkzer Borg, told Poppen his association would campaign for him if he ran for the Prussian Landtag. Poppen entered politics and joined the Center Party, better known as the Centrum. The monarchist Poppen formed part of the conservative wing of the party that rejected democracy and the Weimar coalition with the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Poppen's politics were much closer to the National Conservative German, National People's Party than to the Centrum, and he seems to have belonged to the Centrum on the account of his Roman Catholicism and a hope that he could shift his party to the right. Poppen was a figure of influence in the Centrum by the virtue of being the largest shareholder, and chief of the editorial board in the party's Catholic newspaper Germania, which was the most prestigious of the Catholic papers in Germany. Poppen was a member of the Landtag of Prussia from 1921 to 1928 and from 1930 to 1932, representing a rural, Catholic constituency in Westphalia. Poppen rarely attended the sessions of the Landtag and never spoke at the meetings during his time as a Landtag deputy. Poppen tried to have his name entered into the Centrum party list for the Reichstag elections of May 1924, but was blocked by the Centrum's leadership. In February 1925, Poppen was one of the six Centrum deputies in the Landtag who voted with the German National People's Party and the German People's Party against the SPD Centrum government. Poppen was nearly expelled from the Centrum for breaking with party discipline in the Landtag. In the 1925 presidential elections, he surprised his party by supporting the right-wing candidate Paul von Hindenburg over Centrum's own Wilhelm Marx. Poppen, along with two of his future cabinet ministers, was a member of Arthur Moller van den Bruck's exclusive Berlin Deutsche Herren Club. In March 1930, Poppen welcomed the coming of presidential government. As the presidential government of Chancellor Heinrich Brüning depended upon the Social Democrats in the Reichstag to tolerate it by not voting to cancel laws passed under Article 48, Poppen grew more critical. In a speech before a group of farmers in October 1931, Poppen called for Bruning to disallow the SPD and base his presidential government on tolerance from the NSDAP instead. Poppen demanded that Bruning transform the concealed dictatorship of a presidential government, 
into a dictatorship that would unite all of the German right under its banner. In the March to April 1932 German presidential election, Poppen voted for Hindenburg on the grounds he was the best man to unite the right, while in the Prussian Landtag's election of Speaker of the Landtag, Poppen voted for the Nazi Hans Kerl. Chapter 5, Chancellorship On 1 June 1932, Poppen was suddenly lifted to supreme importance when President Hindenburg appointed him Chancellor. Poppen owed his appointment to the Chancellorship to General Kurt von Schleicher, an old friend from the pre-war general staff and an influential advisor of President Hindenburg. Schleicher selected Poppen because his conservative, aristocratic background and military career were satisfactory to Hindenburg and would create the groundwork for a possible center Nazi coalition. Schleicher, who became defense minister, selected the entire cabinet himself. The day before, Poppen had promised party chairman Ludwig Kass he would not accept any appointment. After he broke his pledge, Kass branded him the Ephialtus of the Center Party after the infamous Battle of Thermopylae Traitor, Poppen forestalled being expelled from the party by leaving it on 31 May 1932. The cabinet that Poppen formed, was known as the Cabinet of Barons or Cabinet of Monocles. Poppen had little support in the Reichstag, the only parties committed to supporting him were the National Conservative German National People's Party and the Conservative Liberal German People's Party. The Centre Party would not support Poppen because he had backstabbed Brüning. Schleicher's planned centre Nazi coalition thus failed to materialise and the Nazis now had little reason to prop up Poppen's weak government. Poppen grew very close to Hindenburg and first met Adolf Hitler in June 1932. Poppen consented on 31 May to Hitler's and Hindenburg's agreement of 30 May that the Nazi party would tolerate Poppen's government if fresh elections were called, the Sturmabteilung ban was cancelled and the Nazis were granted access to the radio network. As agreed, the Poppen government dissolved the Reichstag on 4 June and called a national election by 31 July 1932, in the hope that the Nazis would win the largest number of seats in the Reichstag which would allow him the majority he needed to establish an authoritarian government. In a so-called presidential government, Poppen would rule by Article 48, having emergency decrees signed into effect by President Hindenburg. On 16 June 1932, the new government lifted the ban on the SA and the SS, eliminating the last remaining rationale for Nazi support for Poppen. In June and July 1932 Poppen represented Germany at the Lausanne Conference where, on 9 July, German reparation obligations were cancelled. Germany had ceased paying reparations in June 1931 under the Hoover Moratorium, and most of the groundwork for the Lausanne Conference had been done by Brüning, but Poppen took the credit for the success. In exchange for cancelling reparations, Germany was supposed to make a one-time payment of 3 million Reichmarks to France, a commitment that Poppen repudiated immediately upon his return to Berlin. Through Article 48, Poppen enacted economic policies on 4 September that cut the payments offered by the Unemployment Insurance Fund, subjected jobless Germans seeking unemployment insurance to a means test, lowered wages, while arranging tax cuts for corporations and the rich. These austerity policies made Poppen deeply unpopular with the masses but had the backing of the business elite but negotiations between the Nazis, the Centre Party and Poppen for a new Prussian government began on 8 June but broke down due to the Centre Party's hostility to the party deserter Poppen. On the 11th of July 1932 Poppen received the support of the cabinet and the president for a decree allowing the Rye government to take over the Prussian government, which was dominated by the SPD in a move that was later justified through the rumor that the Social Democrats and the Communist Party of Germany were planning a merger. The political violence of the so-called Altona Bloody Sunday between Nazis, Communists and the police on 17 July, gave Poppen his pretext. On 20 July, Poppen launched a coup against the SPD coalition government of Prussia, in the so-called Priusenschlag. Berlin was put on military shutdown and Poppen sent men to arrest the SPD Prussian authorities, whom he accused with no evidence of being in league with the communists. Hereafter, Poppen declared himself commissioner of Prussia by way of another emergency decree that he elicited from Hindenburg, 
further weakening the democracy of the Weimar Republic. Poppen viewed the coup as a gift to the Nazis, who had been informed of it by the 9th of July, who were now supposed to support his government. On 23 July, Poppen had German representatives walk out of the World Disarmament Conference after the French delegation warned that allowing Germany Gleichberechtigung like gun in armaments would lead to another world war. Poppen announced that the Reich would not return to the conference until the other powers agreed to consider his demand for Gleichberechtigung. Like gun. In the Reichstag election of 31 July the Nazis won the largest number of seats. To combat the rise in SA and SS political terrorism that began right after the elections, Poppen on 9 August brought in via Article 48 a new law that drastically streamlined the judicial process in death penalty cases while limiting the right of appeal. New special courts were also created. A few hours later in the town of Potempa, five SA men killed the communist laborer Konrad Pichazu in the Potempa murder of 1932. The Potempa Five were promptly arrested and then convicted and sentenced, to death on 23 August by a special court. The Potempa case generated enormous media attention, and on 2 September, Poppen in his capacity as Reich Commissioner for Prussia reduced the sentences of the five SA men down to life imprisonment after Hitler made it clear that he would not support Poppen's government if they were executed. On the 11th of August, the public holiday of Constitution Day, which commemorated the adoption of the Weimar Constitution in 1919. Poppen and his interior minister Baron Wilhelm von Gehl called a press conference to announce plans for a new constitution that would, in effect, turn Germany into a dictatorship. Two days later, Schleicher and Poppen offered Hitler the position of vice-chancellor, who rejected it. When the new Reichstag assembled on 12 September, Poppen hoped to destroy the growing alliance between the Nazis and the Center Party. That day at the President's estate in New Deck, Poppen, Schleicher and Gale obtained in advance from Hindenburg a decree to dissolve Parliament, then secured another decree to suspend elections beyond the constitutional 60 days. The Communists made a motion of no confidence in the Poppen government. Poppen had anticipated this move by the Communists, but been assured that there would be an immediate objection. However, when no one objected, Poppen placed the red folder containing the dissolution decree on Reichstag President Hermann Göring's desk. He demanded the floor in order to read it, but Göring pretended not to see him, the Nazis and the Center Party had decided to support the Communist motion. The motion carried by 512 votes to 42. Realizing that he did not have nearly enough support to go through with his plan to suspend elections, Poppen decided to call another election to punish the Reichstag for the vote of no confidence. On 27 October, the Supreme Court of Germany issued a ruling that Poppen's coup deposing the Prussian government was illegal, but allowed Poppen to retain his control of Prussia. In November 1932, Poppen violated the terms of the Treaty of Versailles by passing an Umbau program for the German Navy of one aircraft carrier, six battleships, six cruisers, six destroyer flotillas and sixteen U-boats, intended to allow Germany to control both the North Sea and the Baltic. In the November 1932 election the Nazis lost seats, but Poppen was still unable to secure a Reichstag that could be counted on not to pass another vote of no confidence in his government. Poppen's attempt to negotiate with Hitler failed. Under pressure from Schleicher, Poppen resigned on 17 November and formed a caretaker government. Poppen told his cabinet that he planned to have martial law declared, which would allow him to rule as a dictator. However, at a cabinet meeting on 2 December, Poppen was informed by Schleicher's associate general Eugen Ott that Ministry of the Reichswehr war games showed there was no way to maintain order against the Nazis and communists. Realizing that Schleicher was moving to replace him, Poppen asked Hindenburg to fire Schleicher as defense minister. Instead, Hindenburg appointed Schleicher as chancellor. Chapter 6 – Bringing Hitler to Power After his resignation, Poppen regularly visited Hindenburg, missing no opportunity to attack Schleicher in these visits. Schleicher had promised Hindenburg that he would never attack Poppen in public when he became Chancellor, but in a bid to distance himself from the very unpopular Poppen, Schleicher in a series of speeches in December 1932-January 1933 did just that, 
upsetting Hindenburg. Poppen was embittered by the way his former best friend, Schleicher, had brought him down, and was determined to become Chancellor again. On 4 January 1933, Hitler and Poppen met in secret at the banker Kurt Baron von Schroeder's house in Cologne to discuss a common strategy against Schleicher. On 9 January 1933, Poppen and Hindenburg agreed to form a new government that would bring in Hitler. On the evening of the 22nd of January, in a meeting at the villa of Joachim von Ribbentrop in Berlin, Poppen made the concession of abandoning his claim to the chancellorship and committed to support Hitler as chancellor in a proposed government of national concentration in which Poppen would serve as vice-chancellor and minister-president of Prussia. On 23 January, Poppen presented to Hindenburg his idea for Hitler to be made chancellor, while keeping him boxed in. On the same day Schleicher, to avoid a vote of no confidence in the Reichstag when it reconvened on 31 January, asked the president to declare a state of emergency. Hindenburg declined and Schleicher resigned at midday on 28 January. Hindenburg formally gave Poppen the task of forming a new government. In the morning of 29 January, Poppen met with Hitler and Hermann Goering at his apartment, where it was agreed that Poppen would serve as vice-chancellor and commissioner for Prussia. It was in the same meeting that Poppen first learned that Hitler wanted to dissolve the Reichstag when he became chancellor and, once the Nazis had won a majority of the seats in the ensuing elections, to activate the Enabling Act in order to be able to enact laws without the involvement of the Reichstag. When the people around Poppen voiced their concerns about putting Hitler in power, he asked them, what do you want? And reassured them, I have the confidence of Hindenburg. In two months, we'll have pushed Hitler so far into the corner that he'll squeal. In the end, the president, who had previously vowed never to let Hitler become chancellor, appointed Hitler to the post at 11.30 a.m. on 30 January 1933, with Poppen as vice-chancellor. While Poppen's intrigues appeared to have brought Hitler into power, the crucial dynamic was in fact provided by the Nazi Party's electoral support, which made military dictatorship the only alternative to Nazi rule for Hindenburg and his circle dot at the formation of Hitler's cabinet on 30 January, only three Nazis held cabinet portfolios, Hitler, Goering, and Wilhelm Frick. The other eight posts were held by conservatives close to Poppen. Additionally, as part of the deal that allowed Hitler to become chancellor, Poppen was granted the right to attend every meeting between Hitler and Hindenburg. Moreover, cabinet decisions were made by majority vote. Poppen believed that his conservative friend's majority in the cabinet and his closeness to Hindenburg would keep Hitler in check. Chapter 7, Vice-Chancellor Hitler and his allies instead quickly marginalized Poppen and the rest of the cabinet. For example, as part of the deal between Hitler and Poppen, Goering had been appointed Interior Minister of Prussia, thus putting the largest police force in Germany under Nazi control. He frequently acted without consulting his nominal superior, Poppen. On 1 February 1933, Hitler presented to the cabinet an Article 48 decree law that had been drafted by Poppen in November 1932 allowing the police to take people into protective custody without charges. It was signed into law by Hindenburg on 4 February as the decree for the protection of the German people. On the evening of 27 February 1933, Poppen joined Hitler. Goering and Goebbels at the burning Reichstag and told him that he shared their belief that this was the signal for communist revolution. On 18 March 1933, in his capacity as Reich Commissioner for Prussia, Poppen freed the Potemper Five under the grounds the murder of Konrad Pietzuch was an act of self-defense, making the five SA men innocent victims of a miscarriage of justice. Neither Poppen nor his conservative allies waged a fight against the Reichstag fire decree in late February, or the Enabling Act in March. After the Enabling Act was passed, serious deliberations more or less ceased at cabinet meetings when they took place at all, which subsequently neutralized Poppen's attempt to box Hitler in through cabinet-based decision-making. Poppen endorsed Hitler's plan presented at a cabinet meeting on 7 March 1933 to destroy that centrum by severing the Catholic Church from that centrum. This was the origin of the Reichskonkordat that Poppen was to negotiate, 
with the Roman Catholic Church later in the spring of 1933. Poppen founded a new political party on 5 April 1933 called the League of German Catholics Cross and Eagle, which was intended as a conservative Catholic party that would hold the NSDOP in check while at the same time working with the NSDOP. Both that Centrum and the Bavarian People's Party declined to merge into Poppen's new party while the rival coalition of Catholic Germans which was sponsored by the NSDOP proved more effective at recruiting German Catholics. On 8 April Poppen travelled to the Vatican to offer a Reichskonkordat that defined the German state's relationship with the Roman Catholic Church. During his stay in Rome, Poppen met the Italian Prime Minister Benito Mussolini and failed to persuade him to drop his support for the Austrian Chancellor Dolphus. Poppen was euphoric at the Reichskonkordat that he negotiated with Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli in Rome, believing that this was a diplomatic success that restored his status in Germany, guaranteed the rights of German Catholics in the Third Reich, and required the disbandment of the Centrum and the Bavarian People's Party, thereby achieving one of Poppen's main political goals since June 1932. During Poppen's absence, the Nazified Landtag of Prussia elected Goering as Prime Minister on 10 April. Poppen saw the end of that centrum that he had engineered as one of his greatest achievements. Later in May 1933, he was forced to disband the League of German Catholics Cross and Eagle owing to lack of public interest. In September 1933, Poppen visited Budapest to meet the Hungarian Prime Minister Dula Gombos, and to discuss how Germany and Hungary might best cooperate against Czechoslovakia. The Hungarians wanted the Volksdeutsche minorities in the Bono, Transylvania, Slovakia and Carpathia to agitate to return to Hungary in cooperation with the Magyar minorities, a demand that Poppen refused to meet. In September 1933, when the Soviet Union ended its secret military cooperation with Germany, the Soviets justified their move under the grounds that Poppen had informed the French of the Soviet support for German violations of the Versailles Treaty. On 14 November 1933, Poppen was appointed the Reich Commissioner for the Tsar. The Tsarland was under the rule of the League of Nations and a referendum was scheduled for 1935 under which the Saarlanders had the option to return to Germany, join France, or retain the status quo. As a conservative Catholic whose wife was from the Tsarland, Poppen had much understanding of the heavily Catholic region, and Poppen gave numerous speeches urging the Saarlanders to vote to return to Germany. Poppen was successful in persuading the majority of the Catholic clergy in the Tsarland to campaign for a return to Germany, and 90% of the Tsarland voted to return to Germany in the 1935 referendum. Poppen began covert talks with other conservative forces with the aim of convincing Hindenburg to restore the balance of power back to the conservatives. By May 1934, it had become clear that Hindenburg was dying, with doctors telling Poppen that the president only had a few months left to live. Poppen together with Otto Meissner, Hindenburg's chief of staff, and Major Oscar von Hindenburg, Hindenburg's son, drafted a political will and last testament, which the president signed on of May 1934. At Poppen's request, the will called for the dismissal of certain Nazi ministers from the cabinet, and regular cabinet meetings, which would have achieved Poppen's plan of January 1933 for a broad governing coalition of the right. Chapter 8 Section 1, The Marburg Speech with the army command recently having hinted at the need for Hitler to control the SA, Poppen delivered an address at the University of Marburg on 17 June 1934 where he called for the restoration of some freedoms, demanded an end to the calls for a second revolution and advocated the cessation of SA terror in the streets. Poppen intended to tame Hitler with the Marburg speech, and gave the speech without any effort at coordination beforehand with either Hindenburg or the Reichswehr. The speech was crafted by Poppen's speech writer, Edgar Julius Jung, with the assistance of Poppen's secretary Herbert von Bose and Catholic leader Erich Klausener, and Poppen had first seen the text of the speech only two hours before he delivered it at the University of Marburg. The Marburg speech was well received by the graduating students of Marburg University, who all loudly cheered the vice-chancellor. Extracts were reproduced in the Frankfurter Zeitung, the most prestigious newspaper in Germany, and from there picked up by the foreign press. The speech incensed Hitler, 
and its publication was suppressed by the propaganda ministry. Poppen told Hitler that unless the ban on the Marburg speech was lifted and Hitler declared himself willing to follow the line recommended by Poppen in the speech, he would resign and would inform Hindenburg why he had resigned. Hitler outwitted Poppen by telling him, that he agreed with all of the criticism of his regime made in the Marburg speech, told him Goebbels was wrong to ban the speech and he would have the ban lifted at once, and promised that the SA would be put in their place, provided Poppen agreed not to resign and would meet with Hindenburg in a joint interview with him. Poppen accepted Hitler's suggestions. Chapter 8 Section 2 Night of the Long Knives Two weeks after the Marburg speech, Hitler responded to the armed forces' demands to suppress the ambitions of Ernst Ruhm and the SA by purging the SA leadership. The purge, known as the Night of the Long Knives, took place between 30 June and 2 July 1934. Though Poppen's bold speech against some of the excesses committed by the Nazis had angered Hitler, the latter was aware that he could not act directly against the Vice-Chancellor without offending Hindenburg. Instead, in the Night of the Long Knives, the vice chancellery Poppen's office, was ransacked by the Schutzstaffel, his associates Herbert von Bose, Erich Klausener and Edgar Julius Jung were shot. Poppen himself was placed under house arrest at his villa with his telephone line cut. Some accounts indicate that this protective custody was ordered by Goering, who felt the ex-diplomat could be useful in the future. Reportedly Poppen arrived at the chancellery, exhausted from days of house arrest without sleep, to find the Chancellor seated with other Nazi ministers around a round table, with no place for him but a hole in the middle. He insisted on a private audience with Hitler and announced his resignation, stating, My service to the fatherland is over. The following day, Poppen's resignation as Vice-Chancellor was formally accepted and publicized, with no successor appointed. When Hindenburg died on 2 August, the last conservative obstacles to complete Nazi rule were gone. Chapter 8 – Ambassador to Austria Hitler offered Poppen the assignment of German ambassador to Vienna, which Poppen accepted. Poppen was a German nationalist who always believed that Austria was destined to join Germany in an Anschluss, and felt that a success in bringing that about might restore his career. During his time as ambassador to Austria, Poppen stood outside the normal chain of command of the Auswartiges AMT as he refused to take orders from Konstantin von Neurit, his own former foreign minister. Instead, Poppen reported directly to Hitler. Poppen met often with Austrian Chancellor Kurt von Schuschenig to assure him that Germany did not wish to annex his country, and only wanted the banned Austrian Nazi Party to participate in Austrian politics. In late 1934 early 1935, Poppen took a break from his duties as German ambassador in Vienna to lead the Deutsche Front in the Saarland plebiscite on 13 January 1935, where the League of Nations observers monitoring the vote noted Poppen's ruthless methods as he campaigned for the region to return to Germany. Poppen also contributed to achieving Hitler's goal of undermining Austrian sovereignty and bringing about the Anschluss. On 28 August 1935, Poppen negotiated a deal under which the German press would cease its attacks on the Austrian government, in return for which the Austrian press would cease its attacks on Germany's. Poppen played a major role in negotiating the 1936 Austro-German agreement under which Austria declared itself a German state whose foreign policy would always be aligned with Berlin's and allowed for members of the national opposition to enter the Austrian cabinet in exchange for which the Austrian Nazis abandoned their terrorist campaign against the government. The treaty Poppen signed in Vienna on the 11th of July 1936 promised that Germany would not seek to annex Austria, and largely placed Austria in the German sphere of influence, greatly reducing Italian influence on Austria. In July 1936, Poppen reported to Hitler that the Austro-German treaty he had just signed was the decisive step towards ending Austrian independence, and it was only a matter of time before the Anschluss took place. In the summer and fall of 1937, Poppen pressured the Austrians to include more Nazis in the government. In September 1937, Poppen returned to Berlin when Benito Mussolini visited Germany, serving as Hitler's advisor on Italo-German talks about Austria. 
Though Poppen was dismissed from his mission in Austria on 4 February 1938, Hitler drafted him to arrange a meeting between the German dictator and Schuschnigg at Berchtesgaden. The ultimatum that Hitler presented to Schuschnigg at the meeting on 12 February 1938 led to the Austrian government's capitulation to German threats and pressure, and paved the way for the Anschluss. Chapter 9, Ambassador to Turkey Poppen later served the German government as ambassador to Turkey from 1939 to 1944. In April 1938, after the retirement of the previous ambassador, Frederick von Keller on his 65th birthday, the German foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop attempted to appoint Poppen as ambassador in Ankara, but the appointment was vetoed by the Turkish president Mustafa Kemal Atatürk who remembered Poppen well with considerable distaste when he had served alongside him in World War I. In November 1938, and in February 1939, the new Turkish President General Ismet Inonu again vetoed Ribbentrop's attempts to have Poppen appointed as German ambassador to Turkey. In April 1939, Turkey accepted Poppen as ambassador. Poppen was keen to return to Turkey, where he had served during World War I. Poppen arrived in Turkey on 27 April 1939 just after the signing of a UK-Turkish Declaration of Friendship. Inonu wanted Turkey to join the UK-inspired peace front that was meant to stop Germany. On 24 June 1939, France and Turkey signed a declaration committing them to upholding collective security in the Balkans. On 21 August 1939, Poppen presented Turkey with a diplomatic note threatening economic sanctions and the cancellation of all arms contracts if Turkey did not cease leaning towards joining the UK-French peace front, a threat that Turkey rebuffed. On 1 September 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and two days later on 3 September 1939 the UK and France declared war on Germany. Poppen claimed later to have been opposed to Hitler's foreign policy in 1939, and was very depressed when he heard the news of the German attack on Poland on the radio. Poppen continued his work of representing the Reich in Turkey under the grounds that resigning in protest would indicate the moral weakening in Germany, which was something he could never do. On 19 October 1939, Poppen suffered a notable setback when Turkey signed a treaty of alliance with France and the UK. During the Foley War, the conservative Catholic Poppen found himself to his own discomfort working together with Soviet diplomats in Ankara to pressure Turkey not to enter the war on the Allied side. In June 1940, with France's defeat, Inonu abandoned his pro-Allied neutrality, and Poppen's influence in Ankara dramatically increased. Between 1940 and 1942 Poppen signed three economic agreements that placed Turkey in the German economic sphere of influence. Poppen hinted more than once to Turkey that Germany was prepared to support Bulgarian claims to Thrace if Turkey did not prove more accommodating to Germany. In May 1941, when the Germans dispatched an expeditionary force to Iraq to fight against the UK in the Anglo-Iraqi War, Poppen persuaded Turkey to allow arms in Syria to be shipped along a railroad linking Syria to Iraq. In June 1941, Poppen successfully negotiated a treaty of friendship and non-aggression with Turkey, signed on 17 June 1941, which prevented Turkey from entering the war on the Allied side. After Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union that began on the 22nd of June 1941, Poppen persuaded Turkey to close the Turkish Straits to Soviet warships, but was unable to have the straits closed to Soviet merchant ships as he demanded. Poppen claimed after the war to have done everything within his power to save Turkish Jews living in countries occupied by Germany from deportation to the death camps, but an examination of the Orswartage AMT's records does not support him. During the war, Poppen used his connections with Turkish army officers with whom he served in World War I to try to influence Turkey into joining the Axis held parties at the German embassy which were attended by leading Turkish politicians and used special funds to bribe Turks into following a pro-German line. As an ambassador to Turkey, Poppen survived a Soviet assassination attempt on 24 February 1942 by agents from the NKVD, a bomb exploded prematurely, killing the bomber and no one else, although Poppen was slightly injured. In 1943, 
Poppen frustrated a UK attempt to have Turkey join the war on the Allied side by getting Hitler to send a letter to Inonu assuring him that Germany had no interest in invading Turkey and by threatening to have the Luftwaffe bomb Istanbul if Turkey joined the Allies. In the summer and fall of 1943, realizing the war was lost, Poppen attended secret meetings with the agents of the US Office of Strategic Services in Istanbul. Poppen exaggerated his power in Germany to the OSS, and asked for U.S. support to make him dictator of a post-Hitler Germany. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt rejected the offer when he heard of it, and told the OSS to stop talking to Poppen. From October 1943, Poppen and the German embassy gained access to the Cicero documents of secret agent Ilyasa Buzna, including information on Operation Overlord and the Tehran Conference, which Poppen revealed selectively to Inonu to strain allied Turkish relations. In January 1944, Poppen, after learning via the Cicero documents of a UK plan to have the Royal Air Force use airfields in Turkey to bomb the oil fields of Pleeshti in Romania, told the Turkish Foreign Minister Hussein Numan Menemansiaglu that if Turkey allowed the RAF to use Turkish airfields to bomb Pleeshti, the Luftwaffe would use its bases in Bulgaria and Greece to bomb and destroy Istanbul and Izmir. On 20 April 1944, Turkey, wishing to ingratiate itself with the Allies, ceased selling chromium to Germany. On 26 May 1944 Menemen announced that Turkey was reducing exports to Germany by 50 percent, and on 2 August 1944 Turkey severed diplomatic relations with Germany, forcing Poppen to return to Berlin. After Pope Pius XI died in February 1939, his successor Pope Pius XII did not renew Poppen's honorary title of Papal Chamberlain. As nuncio, the future Pope John XXIII, Angelo Roncalli, became acquainted with Poppen in Greece and Turkey during World War II. The German government considered appointing Poppen ambassador to the Holy See, but Pope Pius XII, after consulting Konrad von Prezing, Bishop of Berlin, rejected this proposal. In August 1944, Poppen had his last meeting with Hitler after arriving back in Germany from Turkey. Here, Hitler awarded Poppen the Knight's Cross of the War Merit Cross. In September 1944, Poppen settled at his estate at Wallafangen in the Saarland that had been given to him by his father-in-law. On 29 November 1944, Poppen could hear in the distance the guns of the advancing U.S. Third Army, which caused him and his family to flee deeper into Germany. Chapter 10, Post-War Years Poppen was captured along with his son Franz Jr. at his own home by First Lieutenant Thomas McKinley and members of the U.S. 194th Glider Infantry Regiment, on 14 April 1945. Also present during the capture was a small band from the 550th Airborne Glider Infantry. Poppen was forced by the U.S. to visit a concentration camp to see firsthand the nature of the regime he had served from start to finish and had fostered. Poppen was one of the defendants at the main Nuremberg war crimes trial. The investigating tribunal found no solid evidence to support claims that Poppen had been involved in the annexation of Austria. The court acquitted him, stating that while he had committed a number of political immoralities, these actions were not punishable under the conspiracy to commit crimes against peace written in Poppen's indictment. Poppen was subsequently sentenced to eight years hard labor by a West German denazification court, but he was released on appeal in 1949. Until 1954, Poppen was forbidden to publish in West Germany, and so he wrote a series of articles in newspapers in Spain attacking the Federal Republic from a conservative Catholic position in much the same terms that he had attacked the Weimar Republic. Poppen unsuccessfully tried to restart his political career in the 1950s, he lived at the castle of Benzinhofen near Ravensburg in Upper Schwabia. Pope John XXIII restored his title of Papal Chamberlain on 24 July 1959. Poppen was also a Knight of Malta, and he was awarded the Grand Cross of the Pontifical Order of Pius IX. Poppen published a number of books and memoirs, in which he defended his policies and dealt with the years 1930-1933 as well as early Western Cold War politics. 
Poppen praised the Schumann plan to pacify relations between France and West Germany as wise and statesmanlike, and believed in the economic and military unification and integration of Western Europe. In 1952 and 1953, Poppen published his memoirs in two volumes in Switzerland. Right up until his death in 1969, Poppen gave speeches and wrote articles in the newspapers, defending himself against the charge that he had played a crucial role in having Hitler appointed Chancellor and that he had served a criminal regime, these led to vitriolic exchanges with West German historians, journalists and political scientists. Franz von Poppen died in Obersasbach, West Germany, on 2 May 1969 at the age of 89. Chapter 11 Publications Apple and Das Deutsche Gewissen. Reden zur Nationalen Revolution, Stalling, Oldenburg, 1933. Franz von Poppen Memoirs, translated by Brian Connell, André Deutsch, London, 1952. Der Wahrheit einer Gosse, Paul List Verlag, Munchen, 1952. Europa, was none. Betrachtungen zur Politik der Westmischt, Göttinger Verlagsanstalt, Göttingen, 1954. Von Schaetern einer Demokratie. 1930-1933, Hase und Kuhler, Mainz, 1968. Chapter 12, In Popular Culture. Franz von Poppen has been portrayed by these actors in these film, television and theatrical productions. Paul Everton in the 1918 U.S. film The Eagle's Eye. Kurt Ferberg in the 1943 U.S. film Background to Danger. Walter Kingsford in the 1944 U.S. film The Hitler Gang. John Wengraf in the 1952 U.S. film Five Fingers. Peter von Zernick in the 1973 U.S. TV production Portrait, A Man Whose Name Was John. Dennis St. John in the 2000 Canadian-slash-US TV production Nuremberg. Erland Josephson in the 2003 Italian-slash-UK TV production The Good Pope, Pope John XXIII. Robert Russell in the 2003 Canadian-slash-US TV production Hitler, The Rise of Evil. Georgi Novakov in the 2006 UK television docudrama Nuremberg, Nazis on Trial. Chapter 13 Section 1, Sources. 